Good afternoon, thank you. <coughs> Members and guests have uh, <coughs> no disclosure. So the risk of bladder infection increases with age, which we know, and we use natural furantin commonly. I'm sure you use that in your practice as well. I don't know if many of you are familiar with the BS criteria. This is a, a group of people in the uh, US who publish fairly regularly. In fact, they had a recent update in 2019 of drugs to, to avoid in people over the age of 65. And natural furantin is one of them, and they caution against the use of long-term, meaning more than 90 days, and they encourage use of other alternative antibiotics which is too bad because the level of evidence is only low. There are only three papers that has data on that. So I was intrigued by that because I'm struggling. This prescription that are getting refused by insurance that send notes to patients that I'm a criminal to keep them on natural trending over 90 days. So I decided to look a little bit at this data myself and review our data in our own center. So we started with the electronic medical records query that gave us lots of charts. We had to basically dwindle down to two urology providers, why, why those? Because those are the one, myself and another person, prescribing natural friend long term the most. And we chose three consecutive months as a minimal follow up because that's the data that the BS criteria is using. So we have a population of 221 patients. We looked at lots of parameters, around 160 in the Excel sheets. And we looked at the start and stop dates of uh, natural friend train episode, which was a challenge because some people go off if they have a respiratory infection or another infection, but we sum them or at least a minimum of 90 days to create some uh, <coughs> common denominator. This is a flow chart that you can treat. It's been published, so you can have access to that. And those are all the data points that we looked at. So there's more data that I can present in three minutes. <laughs> Most of the results here is broken down between neurogenics and non-neurogenics. You can see the age groups a little bit older in the non-neurogenic than the neurogenic patients. The duration of follow-up is 1.2 years for the first group and 2.4 years for the second group. You have indication of a little bit different, and breakthrough TIs are a bit different. But by and large, when you look at specifics complication, which were pulmonary fibrosis, <coughs> neurotoxicity, and liver dysfunction, the numbers are pretty low, as you would expect. We had one patient with liver dysfunction. She stopped after 3.5 years of therapy, and the function liver function re returned to normal, so it was probably related to the drug. We had four patients that developed lux symptoms after mean use of 3.5 years, range one to six years. None had chronic cough. Those with changes in chest x-rays, none of them stopped nitroferrin therapy. And those who had side effects of nitroferrin, and three of them were under the age of 65 anyway. So that means that we have very few patients affected by this restrictive approach. So yes, you have to be very cognizant of these adverse events. Yes, you have to follow the patient. Yes, you have to document medical legally that you've had the discussion with the patient about those risks and the family. And you have to see them regularly to refill the natural furantrin prescription, but being that being said, I think it's totally acceptable to give that in those patient population. I would add to that that we have another paper that showed that the other drugs are basically not effective in many of these patients. In about 25 to 30 percent of patients, that's the only drug you can give to them to treat the UTIs. Thank you. If anyone has any questions come up while I'm coming up with one. So I agree with you. I mean, I happen to use this a lot. The only thing I think, and I'm glad you mentioned it, and it was something that was said in the last session over and over, is you just have to bring this up to your patient so they understand that there is a risk, albeit small, because many of us have seen some of these things. Uh, the other question, though, that I had is, do you do any specific, when they come back, do you order any labs or do anything specifically to look at these things? Well, I look at that also. Uh, I published a paper on that looking at the recommendation literature. There were about 12 recommendations to do chest x-rays and liver function tests at regular intervals. Nobody has really studied the cost effectiveness to detect one rare event. So I suspect the cost effectiveness is not there. But there's no strong recommendation on that. They said you should monitor your patient. But I think the best way is to tell your patient that there's a very small risk and then, just, as you said, document that, document that discussion and connect with your primary care physician, because if that patient has cough during the winter period and stops it, that's fine. But many of them go back on natural and nothing happens. That's all good. So. I didn't listen. What dose did you use? For oh, patients? that's a good point. We didn't use any specific dose since it's a retrospective data. Most of them were 100 milligram and with some on 50 milligrams daily, correct? Yeah. Okay. As it turned out, it's harder to find 50 milligram now than 100 milligram for some. Thank you.